Welcome to On Deck with the Cats, the official show of the Ketua Kettleers, taking you through everything happening around Lowell Park and all throughout the village. Now here is your Ketua media team for this episode of On Deck with the Cats. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to On Deck with the Cats, a new show that gives you the inside scoop on all things Ketuit Kettleers heading into the 2021 campaign. I'm your host, broadcaster Chris Carey, joined by my partner in the booth and brother Stefan Carey. We have a very special episode with a lot to cover and two awesome guests. Stefan, take it away. Thanks so much, Chris. We have two men that need no introduction for the Ketuit faithful, but for those who are unfamiliar with them, too, Joining us for the episode are Roy Reese. He's on the board of directors for the Ketuit Athletic Association and is the voice of the Ketuit Kettleers. And we have Coach Mike Roberts, who is the manager of the Kettleers, three-time CCBL champion with the team. Guys, so happy to have you on the show. It's great to be here. We, we look forward to this evening. Thank you. And so have we. It's It's been a long time coming to get this show started, but... We're talking about a long period of time for our first question. Let's turn the clocks back 17 months. The date is August 9th, 2019. The Kettleers just secured their 17th championship of the CCBL. What was that like for you two? Roy, I'll ask you first, up in the press box, that day is obviously unprecedented, thinking about the times we're in now. What, what did you see and what did you feel on that day? Well, let me just set a little example and a little scene setter for you. Lowell Park, third base stands, jam-packed. Uh, all the way down toward the bullpen, uh, fans sitting maybe three, four deep. All around the ballpark, from left field to right field, behind the fence, maybe three deep people all the way around. Then you get to the first base stands, jam-packed. And all the way down from the end of the stands down to the bullpen, probably three, four deep down there. Ballpark on most games, Chris, we probably would have 12, 1300 people. And for this game, we probably had 2,500 people jammed into little Lowell Park. Now you gotta just imagine this, the electricity, uh, the energy that was generated by the fans for this game. Kettle Ears, uh, under Coach Roberts, had won two championships but they had never won one at home. And it's a little different when you're at home winning a championship. And this was their opportunity to do so. They had won the night before and probably the greatest game ever played in the Cape, a 15 inning thriller that had people on the edge of their seats. And it was, I thought, the best game I've ever seen in my 12 years watching the Cataliers. So here we are back at Lowell Park and I tell you, you said 17 months ago, it feels like yesterday to me now that I'm talking about it. I'm perched up in the press box, these fans just going bananas with every pitch and we get to the ninth inning and uh, it was just every pitch, strike one, the fans were just exploding. And when the game finally ended, everyone rushes the field. Uh, Coach Roberts, he's in the, in the third base dugout. I don't know what he was doing because you couldn't even find him. Uh, and it was just mayhem, and it was just a tremendous celebration at Lowell Park. They had won their championship at home in front of 2,500 people, and the village of Ketuit just resonated with this excitement. I don't know whether that uh, describes it to you, Coach, but, I mean, you had to have great feelings, too. Well, yes, and Roy, I think you did an excellent job of taking us around beautiful Lowell Park, which is, you know, 19 acres surrounds it. And it's kind of like the, the new field of dreams as it was explained years ago by ESPN. And you feel like the fans are coming out of the woods, which they are. And uh, yes, yeah, a unique day, 15 inning game the night before, finishes at midnight, uh, three o'clock game the next day, uh, maybe four o'clock maybe. And um, our players were so excited to play, but to kind of, Again, just uh, take you through a little bit. You, it's one of those fields in the dugout, uh, whether you're in the Major League World Series like the Dodgers were this year, or the Red Sox several times, or I was in the ballpark. I work for the Cubs when I'm not with the Kettleers uh, in 16. It's a feeling that you just know something good's going to happen. 
and it actually relaxes you a lot. And uh, from the first inning, you know, we felt like we were going to dominate that day, and the players did, and they deserved it. This wasn't a group that, you know, lucked through the season. They really bonded as most championship teams do. So Chris and Stefan, Roy witnessed it, but for me, watching the guys uh, run out on the field, dogpile, uh, I was actually taking my uh, sunglasses off Roy so they wouldn't get destroyed, and I was putting them <laughs> in my baseball bag. I, I want to give you one funny moment that kind of maybe will uh, bring it all together and, and uh, take us on to uh, up to date, is that in the ninth inning, Casey Smith came on the mound, and you've got all these marvelous players standing around the mound, first, second, third, and short. Casey had come in to pitch the ninth inning, and, you know, it's kind of like Casey at the bat. I mean, it's an incredible moment. Um, and I walk out, and Casey and <clears throat> Cody Pasick are in the grass toward home plate, and the, the four infielders and myself are standing there. We're just kind of looking at each other. Nobody said a word. And you've got one out uh, <clears throat> in the ninth inning, and Casey's got great stuff. We know nobody's going to hit him, but he – He'd walked a couple people, which was unusual for him. So Casey and Cody walked back up on the mound. Nobody said a word. And Casey looked at the other six of us and said, I'm sorry, guys. With his California smile and cool as if, you know, no worries. I just happened to walk a couple guys. I'm so and nobody said a word. I turned around and walked back to the dugout. And, of course, Casey gets the next out and a double play line drive at shortstop. So it was an amazing uh, group of guys and ending. And I think as we lead on, guys, I, I just want to say thank you to our fans. We're disappointed that we didn't get to see our fans, um, no matter the score of games in 2020, because as you young men will find out, we have the most loyal fans, the most vocal fans uh, uh, in the Cape. And so it's just a marvelous place uh, to play baseball. And we're saddened by missing 2020, but Roy and I and the board and our assistant coaches and everybody, other people that are getting prepared, we're really looking forward to 2021 and glad you uh, guys are going to be in the press box up there beside Roy. Well, Coach, we're so excited to be a part of such a storied organization and to make company with the both of you, especially today. But in this instance, the 2019 championship, you had won two others coming into that game. Where would you rank it amongst your other accolades with the team? Well, that's a really good question. It's a tough question. You know, I think every team, as, as coaches will say, are special. I think the 19 team, this is the way I would describe it, is they were very bonded as they came to the park every day to get better. They were, they, they, everybody did. And when we brought guys on late in the season, Trey Holland, who pitched a shutout against Falmouth, and he's a division three pitcher and, and other guys that came on to help us, Harrison Cohen came on. They accepted these new players as if they had been there the whole season. So I categorize them as very humble, but talented. And I think, uh, again, when you're humble and you're talented and you care about each other and the fans can feel that, it's a special, special group. But I do want to go back and say that I've communicated with some of the guys from the 2010 championship team, like James McCann, who just signed a four-year contract with the Mets, and uh, Nick Tropiano, who I call the toughest guy ever to come off of Long Island, um, and some guys from the 2013 championship team. It's really fun to kind of connect those together, but I want to say thank you to the 2019 team, and uh, you're going to see a bunch of those guys play in the big leagues, guys. Just look up soon, and you'll see Nick Gonzalez and a few other guys playing in the big leagues, so it was a special group. Well, Coach Roy, thank you so much for that amazing uh, loop through time to go back to August 9th, 2019. We can't wait to get to uh, Lowell Park. We hear amazing things. We've already uh, been equipped with an amazing staff around us. And, and now I'd like to look at the here and now 
Um, honestly, we, we had no idea that baseball was going to disappear in 2020 until it did. And for a storied organization like Katuit and the Cape uh, at, at a greater capacity, what was that like for you in these past six months, Coach, trying to find these players? When did your process start? Well, the process is always ongoing. There, there is never a week and hardly even two or three days goes in between that, that uh, Bruce Murphy and I are not working on the team. And not only Bruce, uh, we, <laughs> you guys I know will be fantastic broadcasters and interns. And we, we feel like we have the best baseball intern working directly with us in the world. And, and that's Peter Flaherty Jr. I, I um, uh, Peter, if you could see the thousands of texts, and I mean thousands, between the 2019 championship game and today, it's amazing how many hours Peter spends on the Katuit Cavaliers. If I listened to him more, we'd probably be better every year uh, if I took his advice. Uh, so we work on it constantly. Uh, this year is scary. 2020 was the normal process. Draft was going to be early June. Uh, normal process, and I hate that there are a lot of outstanding players that were coming to Katuit in 2020 that uh, we won't get the opportunity to ever see at Lowell Park. Um, but 2021 is very different, a little bit scary. You have the draft in mid-July, something we've never had before. So if you bring in a veteran team that are all draftable, and let's say you bring in 15 of your 30 permanent players and 10 of them sign in mid-July, then we may be up in the press box getting Chris and Stefan and Roy in uniform. <laughs> you don't want me, coach. <laughs> hey, it's going to be very, very different um, with the draft in the middle of the season because a lot of players – and I'll give you an example. Uh, Dante Williams um, – Robbie Martin, Dante Williams from Arizona, Robbie Martin from Florida State. You know, some guys that played with us in 2019 that are going to be good draft choices are, want to come back and pitch. Sean Sullivan, who pitched the championship game, wants to come back and throw innings. So trying to mesh what you hope will be there at the end of the season with what's going to be there at the beginning of the season will be something different that Myself, Roy, Bruce Murphy, our GM, our fans, and you guys as announcers have not seen before. It's the other fun. thing. The other it's thing, fun. Coach, yeah, it's exciting, yeah. but it's different. The other thing is we don't know how many rounds the major league draft is going to be either, which throws another question mark in the whole process of selecting the players. Right. If it's five rounds, then, you know, a lot of those guys are going to stay. If it's 20 rounds, you're going to see a mass exodus from the Cape Cod League. So stay tuned. Uh, we'll kind of see what happens. And I think the other thing I would add, Chris and Stefan, is that like the Ivy League, and we have several Ivy League guys coming, they're not going to play, it looks like, at all. Um, and if some other leagues don't play or play very few games, you know, there could be some real roster shuffling, uh, particularly for leagues and players that don't play at all. Because the thing that you want to try to prevent is bringing guys to the Cape League who have very little experience. So, um, yes, good question. Very different. And stay tuned every week because it will change. Well, it certainly sounds like it is an uphill battle in terms of the 2021 changes. But you said something before we really got into that that was really interesting to me. From an organizational standpoint, we do have some of the best interns and some of the best higher ups in the Cape. And I've noticed that there's just a sense of cohesion with the Katuit Cavaliers. Roy, my question for you, do you notice that within the community? Is that something that continues to move into the team? Is that a Katuit ideology that, that we maybe will see? I'm gonna go back 12 years ago and 12 years ago, Paul Logan introduced me to the Katuit Cavaliers, and uh, I didn't live in Katuit. And when I went to the first meeting, I sensed a sense of pride and uh, joy and camaraderie uh, that I had not seen in too many organizations. And I had been a lot of different places at work and in different en environments. And that got me 
to say, hey, I want to be a part of this. And the meetings are great. We usually will have 20, 25 volunteers coming to meetings in the middle of the winter time. Um, and it's all part of Ketuit. Ketuit is a very, very special place. It's small, we're the smallest location in the smallest town out of all the Cape League teams. And the people are, they're the most loyal fans you'll ever see. And they just come rain, snow, well, well it doesn't snow in the summertime, but <laughs> rain or shine. And, and they're there, win or lose. And they, they don't really, they don't care. You know, they just wanna be a part of the Kettle Ears and it's part of the culture of Ketuit. And it's, I don't know, many years old. Uh, I don't know how many years, maybe 40, 50 years old, maybe even longer than that, Coach. And uh, it's, it's just something to behold. It really is, guys. I mean, you'll see when you get there, the feeling of camaraderie, togetherness, uh, pride of being a Ketuit Ketalia. There's just something about it. I can't describe it uh, better than that. You have to feel it. One, one, one trip to the, to the Ketuit Grocery, what we call a coot, on game day, and you'll feel it. You'll yeah. feel it. <laughs> so we talk about the camaraderie and the pride, and, and you going back 12 years ago when you decided, Roy, to join this organization, um, and now you're on the board of directors. You're the voice, essentially, of the Ketaliers. And it has taken a lot of steps to get to where the Ketaliers are now. And they're always constantly trying to improve. Uh, we're here a little bit to talk about the home run club. The baseball team yeah. needs help. Everybody needs more funding. Can you explain to us what the home run club entails? I sure can. Well, first of all, let me just say that we try to run a first class organization every single step of the way, no matter what it is, we want the best uniforms, the best everything. And of course, it takes funding to do that. And being the smallest community in the Cape, we have to be most creative and really come up with some ingenuity of how we're gonna raise funds because we don't have as many businesses to call on. Several years ago, Peter Flaherty Sr. Um, came up with the idea of a home run club uh, in honor of one of our great fans who passed away. And that was Bob Siegel. And Bob was uh, just a terrific, terrific fan who was at every single game. His son was an intern, I think for five or six years, he was uh, the uh, scoreboard operator. And then he eventually moved uh, into the Cape League and became the official scorer for Ketuit. And we formed a, a home run club whereby people could donate uh, X amount of dollars for every home run hit by a Kettleier at Lowell Park during the season. And we've run this for a couple of years and we raised pretty good money uh, for this. And this year we figured we're gonna try to uh, zero in on this and maybe expand the opportunity for people who wanna donate to us. And we're asking for people uh, to donate $100 for every home run hit uh, by a Kettleier at at the ballpark at Lowell Park with a maximum number of 25 home runs hit by the Kettleers during the season. And we're hoping to get 10 people who will come on board on the club this first year. We're already up to four, so we're looking for six more. And uh, we just keep chipping away. And if anyone has any uh, suggestions of people that uh, need to be contacted, please, you can get in touch with me. Uh, I'm sure my uh, email address, my telephone number, my cell number is somewhere on the website, but I'd be more than glad to give it to you. It's irreese44 at gmail.com. My cell number is 774-274-0225. Uh, hopefully we get some more and we're going to just keep working and working and working on this thing so that we can continue to bring in the funds that we need so that the Kettleers can always, and I mean always, be uh, a first-class organization from top to bottom. That's that's what the kettle, that's what the home run club is. Well, and, and what are beautiful uniforms if you don't have seventeen-time champions, and that is representative of the team. It's great to see that you guys are thinking outside the box, especially right now in 2021 when we've been through so much. Small business has been through so much. Would you say that this is something that's in absolute need, or do you feel that it's something that has potential to grow for many years to come? Well, we want it to grow for many years to come. And uh, that's why nothing comes easy. 
Stefan, nothing. And uh, you have to work at things no matter what it is, broadcasting, coaching, ball playing, um, just keep grinding away, you know, looking for, for different people who want to be part of the Katuit Ketelier organization, who are proud of it and uh, who want to contribute. And we're hoping that eventually this thing will grow and grow and grow and who knows where it goes. And these, the these, these fans may live a long ways away. They may not, they may not live in Katuit. Right. Uh, it's also a tax deductible donation. Yeah. And, uh, so we're excited and Roy's done a magnificent job and I've got some names I'm still hiding from him that he's <laughs> got to pull out of me. So I, I'm going to give him some more names, but uh, we're very blessed as Roy said, to have a strong footprint in a financially, the organization is in good shape, but we want to continue to grow. And so um, I encourage anybody to, to sign up and help us with the, the, Home Run Club and uh, communicate with Roy, uh, we would appreciate it, right? I want to just say one other thing that uh, Stefan said about 2021. Uh, for any fan who hasn't been to Lowell Park, wait till you get there because you're going to see some marked improvement from 2019. Coach Roberts has worked so hard on our capital project. You're going to see brand new stands in first base. You're going to see a brand new bullpen out in left field so that it frees up more space for our wonderful fans down the third base side. You're going to see new pavers on the first base side so more people can sit there in their lawn chairs. It is one of the greatest settings I've ever seen in my life for a baseball game. I got to tell you guys, when I'm upstairs and I've got the greatest seat in the house, uh, Stefan and Chris, you've got the next best seat. I think the coach has got a better seat. But I'm right behind the plate. And it is like being in heaven watching a baseball game from up there because Lowell Park is the prettiest ballpark I've ever seen in my life. And it is just gorgeous. And it's a treat and an honor uh, just to be part of the organization and to do what I do. It really is. Now, Coach, th those are big words from Roy about the, the biggest seat in, or the best seat in the house. You have probably the best uh, standing area in, in the entire stadium because you are on the field, essentially. It, do, do you agree that Roy has it or, or, or do you have it? No, Roy has it and you guys do. And the next best seat is the top row, which was the third baseline only on the gorgeous new Port Orford Cedar stands. But now there'll be a great seat equal on the top row of the first baseline as well. Uh, there are mornings when the sun comes up so beautifully in Katuit over Katuit Bay that I'll go up and I'll sit on the top row in the stands on the third base side and just sit there and enjoy the view. Um, if I could cut the tops out of just the trees a little bit to be able to see the water, it would be the greatest view in the world. Uh, but no, you guys have the best seat. And, um, but if you're going field level, I have the best seat if you're going field level. You'll love watching the coach in the dugout. You know what I mean? He's got his little book. One of these days I'm going to ask him, tell me what the heck is in that book? He's always got a book that he puts behind his back and he's writing in that book. And I'd love to know what he has in that book as a reporter, but it's, it's wonderful just to watch him in the dugout, you know, and the, what he goes through watching the team. One of these days, there'll be a book written about the book in my backside. <laughs> <laughs> so for two Southern guys that have never been up to the Cape, beyond Lowell Park and events that occur in Katuit, what do you guys enjoy the most? I know that there are several things that are hosted at the stadium, but just for people that are, that are newcomers, what would you have to say about the village of Katuit? Well, I'm going to grab that one from Roy. Um, <laughs> he's been there 12 years. I've been there like 18 now. And, and really, I, I played, I started coaching in the Cape in 1984. I started sending players there in the 70s as the coach at UNC Chapel Hill. These are the things that, that I would say. The July 4th parade is the greatest parade anywhere in the United States. When COVID is over, and you guys can see July 4th Parade. It is something you don't want to miss. Every 
child is wearing red, white, and blue. Every dog has got, you know, a jacket on. And it's amazing what goes on. Uh, I think that's part of it. I think when you look at the Katuit Grocery, it, it's an amazing little deli where the players go and gather, where when people, you know, think I don't coach very well, they'll call me and say, can I have a meeting it's with you at the Coop? And I said, yeah, I'll be glad to meet with you as long as you buy me a, some great food at the deli. Um, you've got, you've got the, the, the oldest children's yacht club in America, just right outside the right field fence uh, in Katuit Bay. And I sit and watch them all the time, Monday through Friday, as they sell those 13 foot skiffs that are built in Katuit. There's just so many wonderful uh, traditions uh, in the village of Katuit uh, that I think you will enjoy all summer long. There's the brush off in the village green beside the library. And the library is my favorite place to go in Katuit because I read to children there every Tuesday morning when we don't have COVID. And the brush off is all the, <clears throat> the wonderful artists in the area. They bring their paintings uh, on a Saturday afternoon. And we send players down there actually for a few hours, even on game day. Um, so it's a, it's a very diverse community, but I'll tell you this, everybody walks around with their head up, whether they're heading to the beach or they're headed, uh, to get on the boat, uh, to take a trip or wherever they may be going. And, uh, as Roy knows, uh, I love the song, Hey, Hey, Katuit. It talks about the village of Katuit. It's, it's a marvelous place, Chris and Stefan. And, and when you get there, it won't take you but a few minutes to understand when you drive down Main Street, you'll see the special, special place it is. One of the things that I like best about the ballpark mm -hmm. and the thing that just is great to watch is when we have the little kids coming through the fence uh, to, to meet the players of the Kettle Years and ask for autographs, I mean, and to see the college kids who are players uh, complying and signing autographs, because a lot of times pro athletes don't do this. And after the game, you'd just see the little kids running around the bases, uh, socializing with the players. I mean, it's, it's America at its greatest. You know, it reminds you of apple pie and, and all the things that, uh, that you just think of. I mean, it's just uh, a dream come true. It really is a whole scene. Uh, and Katuit is one of the prettiest little places you'll ever see. I mean, there aren't too many uh, strip malls or any of that stuff that you see. Uh, elsewhere in America. So just brace yourself. You know, I think I would add to that uh, to close out this section, <clears throat> session area, is that Roy and I, I can hear it in Roy's voice, at board meetings, and I certainly feel the same way. We know that we've been blessed to be there and we want the people that come in behind us to be the announcer, to be the next coach, to be on the board of directors, we want to leave them with absolutely the best situation possible uh, in every way. And that's our goal. Um, and, and, we're, and we're trying to do that. And I think, I think everybody on the board and our fans and support, we're doing that. And um, it, it's an amazing situation. I, I just assume, I love Wrigley Field. I love it, I love it. I love Fenway Park, but I don't love it any more than I love Lowell Park. And I can obviously see that the anticipation is building for you both. So here's a little question on the fly. Roy, have you been training your vocal cords on the way to uh, Lowell Park for 2021? And coach, uh, your, your steal, steal the bass signs, your uh, dust off your pants. Have you, have you been doing that in the backyard? I'll let Roy go. I can hardly wait for 2021. I got to tell you, I mean, it was such a void not having baseball this last past summer. And uh, to me, Everything I do in the summer is, is really geared around uh, the 22, uh, I think it was 21 home dates because we had a double header and, and going on the road, you know, and uh, when I don't have to work, nothing like going to Chatham for a seven o'clock game or to Bourne to watch that or, or anywhere, you know, Orleans down for a seven o'clock game and coming home by 1130, 12 o'clock. Um, there's nothing quite like it, you know, the camaraderie, relationships that you build in the summertime um it just it's it's just fantastic you know i want to just say one other thing the 
You mentioned August 9th, you know, that, that date. And I don't want to go back there, but there's so much excitement. But there's also a downside to that because at the end of the night, you're saying goodbye. And you're never going to see some of these players again. And, you know, the team, they're not going to be there the next couple of days. Many of the players leave the next day or two days afterwards. So it's so exhilarating to, to win the championship during that final game. But then maybe a half hour or 45 minutes later, mm -hmm. you come down from that high and you realize you're not going to see these people again. And, and the, the memory is fading and it's, you know, that's part of it. And it's really very, very, very difficult that last day. Yeah, Chris, Stefan, it is, um, get ready because it flies. I'm telling you, it is, well, it is a quick two months. Um, I have friends, they'll tell you, they get depressed the second what Roy was describing. And they are great people with good jobs, but they love it so much. And all of a sudden, whoop, you know, it's gone. As far as practicing, my, my father had a saying, he would tell the kids, he didn't know much about baseball. He was a, he owned a mom and pop lumber yard and never played except in a cow pasture with a sock ball. Um, but he would <laughs> tell all of us, if your uniform isn't dirty by the fifth inning, then slide in front of the dugout. <laughs> he, he's, uniforms are to be washed. So yes, I practice year round, but I can tell you, since I don't manage in the Cubs organization, I'm rusty when I get there. I'm no different than anybody else getting back out and coaching third base and making those decisions. I tell the players, look, you know, I, I'm probably not very good early. You got to stick with me and my mistakes a little bit because uh, it takes a little bit of time to warm up. But will my pants be dirty and my book in the back of my pants? Yes, I'll be ready. My dad was always a big proponent of wearing the socks up high, Alfonso Soriano style. <laughs> and I know we're both so excited to come up to the Cape and to broadcast. Chris is so excited that he'll just narrate me making dinner sometimes. <laughs> so that is uh, something that we're certainly looking forward to. Thank you both so much for joining us on episode two. We really look forward to meeting you guys when we get to the Cape. Uh, we look forward to seeing you guys up there. And you're going to have, trust me, the greatest summer you'll ever have in your life. And it'll be something that you will never, ever forget. Thank you for this evening. And uh, I just want to make sure people see my championship sweatshirt. Oh, look at that. 2019 and Roy enjoy Florida. And we'll all gather together sometime right after Memorial Day at Lowell Park. And we look forward to that. Uh, so everybody stay safe and healthy. Wonderful. Awesome. Well, for anybody that wants to look at that apparel, definitely hit up the store in Katuit. And if you want to join the Home Run Club, Roy Reese's information will be on the website. This has been episode two of the On Deck with the Cats show. Stephen Carey and my brother, Chris, look forward to episode three coming soon. And guys, thank you so much once again. Seriously, we are so excited to get started in, in Katuit. And like Stefan said, episode three will be on the way. And we are so glad to kick it off uh, episode two with you two. And we can't wait to see you in Lowell Park uh, very soon.